All right, okay, we're back. <laughs> I do apologize uh, for our brief uh, kind of cut off on the last video. That was not exactly formal. There was a little incident with my uh, dog. He just had to go use the restroom, and I accidentally kind of pushed the stop button instead. So we're just going to go ahead here and do this kind of second little uh, video. I can't really link them to my knowledge, so this will just cover the rest of our little discussion that we had from the previous video. So I do apologize, <laughs> but we're going to get this done. We're almost done anyway. And anyway, I think what we left off on the last video was around the idea of the formation, uh, we just got into the formation of the Confederacy, and in, as I was mentioning in the pre previous video, video, if you watched it, if you didn't, you might want to go back to watch part one. I insist that you watch part one first because of this little mishap, but if you did not, we t got, when it came to about an end right before the incident happened, we had just, I believe, gotten onto the topic of the the southern states had just seceded, and now they're starting to come together as a southern nation, as the Confederate states. Now, I'm probably going to repeat a little bit here, so well, bear with me. So, as I may have mentioned in the other video, some northerners were not exactly opposed to the southern states really seceding at all. There were many abolitionists that believed that the southern states had only been stubborn and kind of stifled the movement to abolish slavery within the United States for years, and that with their absence, it would be easier to abolish it within the United States as a whole. So some of them actually welcomed the southern states leaving and forming their own nation, while many, including the federal government and including President Lincoln, who increasingly saw that war was only going to be a possible, not just a possibility, but probably a likelihood due to the violent actions that were being perpetrated by the southern southern secessionists he they rapidly wanted to preserve the union even if they had to use force and lincoln perfectly played the southern states really i mean he didn't he didn't start the war the confederates did he only sent provisions to fort sumter and it was the confederates that opened fire first they fired the opening shots not the union not the united states now what was the Southern states' opinion? The Southern states, as I think I mentioned in the last video, they gradually came together due to the idea of Southern unity that had really been perpetrated by senators such as John C. Calhoun in the 20 years or so prior. There was very much a sense that they share a similar economy. They share a similar way of life. They share – they're very much similar in many ways. Similar economy, way of life, people. There's many different details that the Southern states shared, and they deem that why would we not? come together. Won't, wouldn't we be stronger if we formed our own nation? Would we not be stronger together than we would be apart? And they realized that, and they, many of them still liked the idea of a United States, except for the part that the United States had seemingly become very contradictorial toward their rights, toward their institution of slavery, yeah, their right to own slaves. It, was, it wasn't just any state's rights. And this really becomes the driving force for a southern nation. Now, we also mentioned that some northerners were concerned, and part of the reason they were concerned was, A, farmers in the Midwest used the Mississippi as kind of a highway system. Well, the Mississippi, the southern portion of it, and the port where it exits into the Gulf of Mexico, is now in secessionist hands. And they need the Mississippi in order to transport their goods down the Mississippi, down the Mississippi River to get to the ocean and be shipped across to Europe. There's manufacturers and merchants in the North who are worried about the economic impact that that could bring. And of course, there is the main factor that there is very widespread Northern opposition to secession. Many Northerners believe the South is not vindicated in doing this, that it's just, it will destroy the nation if they secede. Now, the seceded Southern states, eventually, they just said, we could care less. And in February of 1861, after the secession of Texas on, I think, February 2nd, they met in Montgomery, Alabama, at the state capitol, and decided that they were going to discuss the creation of a new southern government, or a new southern republic. And they eventually wrote a new constitution and declared for the creation of a new southern nation. The Confederate States of America, one of the darkest chapters in American history. Why? Because these people, all they plainly wanted to do, plain and simple, was own black people. 
and they didn't care how they could go about doing that. They just wanted to own blacks. They write this new constitution, and they even elect their own president. Former Secretary of War under President Franklin Pierce, Jefferson Davis, is elected as the first president and only president of the Confederate States of America. They have their own vice president. They have The president has his own cabinet. They have a Confederate Congress. It's basically a copy of the United States. Even the Constitution of the Confederacy was just like the United States Constitution with two notable exceptions. A, the states had much greater individual freedom in the Confederate Constitution. The states were much more free to run their own affairs without federal government intervention. And the other big one, which well, part also may I mention that with the states having more individual freedom, the central government was far more restricted in the Confederate government than it was in the United States government. And of course, the big one, and this is to you slavery deniers, there is an explicit clause in the Confederate States Constitution that explicitly states slavery is protected and shall never be abolished. The right to own slaves will never be abolished within the Confederacy. There is an explicit clause in the Confederate Constitution protecting the institution of slavery. Oh, but it wasn't about slavery. Then why would they have that in there? Huh? You want to answer me that? Do you? Guess what? I bet you can't answer that question, can you? Nope. So that goes there. Now, let me think here. What else have we had? And further evidence, that before we really go and maybe show a couple things here, before we get to the end of this video, as this was just the continuation of the previous video that kind of got cut short because of a techni technical mishap. Um, the further proof here, if you really need it, that the Confederate states were pro-slavery was the statement made by the Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens of Georgia. Now, Stevens was actually a former friend of President Lincoln, and he had known Lincoln. He had served in Congress with Lincoln briefly during Lincoln's brief two years in Congress. And Stevens was now Vice President of the Confederate States, and after the adoption of the Confederate Constitution, Stevens put what he was known... Oh my goodness. What, what I'm trying to think what he called it. Oh god, there was a, what was its name? There is a word there is a name for the uh statement that he released after the adoption of the Confederate Constitution. I just can't really think of the name right now. You can look it up, but there is a name for it. I cannot it cannot come to my head right now what it is. But anyway, in the essential part of the statement, Stevens states that the Confederate states are created around the basic truth, as he puts it, that the black man is inferior to the white man. Or he uses the one N-word, but I ain't going to use it. But he basically says the black man is inferior to the white man, and that his natural place, yes, his natural place is in servitude and bondage. He is never to have the rights of a white man. His natural place is in servitude and bondage to the superior race. This was coming from the Confederate vice president, but oh, the Confederacy was not about slavery. Well, all you pro, all you anti-slavery deniers, how about you go back in time and you actually ask your ancestors what they were fighting for? And I guarantee you, they're, they're going to tell you that. They're going to tell you that. How about you tell them it isn't about slavery? Because I can guarantee you they probably slap you almost upside the head and tell you, what are you thinking, boy? Of course it's about slavery. But this was coming from the Confederate vice president. Oh, but it's not about slavery. Then why on God's green earth are they stating, stating that African Americans are inferior and naturally deserve to be in slavery? And they have a clause protecting it. They've seceded over the issue that Lincoln has said that he'll prevent its expansion. There's a common theme here. Now, you're, uh, we're really going to get in this discussion either at the end of this week or next week when we hit the lost cause, because that is just sick in my mind that people actually believe this crap. But we're, we'll really get into it then. But I'm just giving you a little bit 
of a preview of oh my goodness it, it, it just it's sick it's just it's stupid it's stupid so anyway we have a couple of things that we'll go ahead and show you in relation to the Confederate States first is a map that we've created it kind of shows you the situation we have well I suppose man we will go ahead and we'll try to explain it as you're looking I know the microphone doesn't always work when I do this well at least not edibly audibly eat microphones <laughs> Anyway, right here is the map of the United States in about 1861. And the green, the green areas and states and territories are territories still belonging to the Union or the actual United States. And so are the yellow. The green and yellow belong to the United States. The orange, of course, is what we commonly would call the Confederate States. This becomes the new Confederate States of America in the orange. And these states are what I refer to as the seceded states, and the green are where slavery is prohibited. There is no slavery in the green states and territories. It, is, it is illegal in those states and territories. They are free. And then the yellow and orange, of course the orange are the ones that have actually broken away to form the Confederate states, but all of the orange ones do have slavery in them, with the exception of uh, the Arizona Territory, which was kind of unique. This was all New Mexico Territory, really. But when the Confederacy broke away, they claimed that the southern portion of the New Mexico Territory had wanted to secede, which they did. They had a secession convention, and that the southern portion of the New Mexico Territory was what the Confederates named Arizona Territory. And later, after the war, the American federal government actually adopted the name Arizona to describe not the southern portion of that territory, but the western portion of it. So, ironically, the state name of Arizona, the first people who actually really use it, as a territorial or state name was actually the Confederates. Before we, they used Arizona as a name before the United States did, except it doesn't need a different area. Part the southern part of Arizona would have been Arizona territory too, but it was split along a north-south line, where later it was along an east-west line. But anyway, that one was not really. I mean, under Confederate law, it would have had slavery because it was Confederate territory. But take that one aside. And the rest of this, including the Indian Territory, which kind of went with the Confederacy because of the broken promises that the United States government had made over the years. I mean, yeah, we're for all with the Confederacy. They broken. They haven't had the chance to break promises yet. But all these are slave states. All the Confederate states are. And then so are the yellow. But what makes the why I colored them different is these states did not break away. These were the only slave states that stayed loyal to the Union, although Maryland came very close and actually had to have the National Guard sent in to stop them from seceding. Now, Kentucky and Missouri were claimed by the Confederacy. They did have some representatives that had declared secession conventions, but they never really controlled the state at all, so it wasn't really legitimate. And Delaware still had it, but it was very few, and they were on its way out in Delaware. But the yellow states were what we would call border states. And these were states that still had, that were slave states, but they did not secede. They stayed with the Union. Now, West Virginia was unique here. And West Virginia was the northwest counties of Virginia. They were pro-Union. They didn't want to break away. Now, as I mentioned at the with this video, we only got seven southern states in February when the Confederacy is first formed. We have Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. South Carolina, and Florida. It isn't till, these are before Fort Sumter. These are the deep south. Now, after Fort Sumter, when Lincoln calls for troops to put down what he calls the Southern Rebellion, that is what pushes Virginia to break away, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. I think I said Arkansas before, but Arkansas was the second wave. So scratch Arkansas for the first one. So prior to Fort Sumter, it was just Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida. After Fort Sumter, you have Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas that also go ahead and join them. So this is just a map to give you a look of what we were looking at by July of 1861, the very first battle of the Civil War when that came in, 18, in July of 1861 at the first battle of Bull Run. And also, I illustrate on here, this is where the capitals were. The initial first capital prior to Virginia joining the Confederacy was the Confederate capital was originally in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, after Virginia joined, they moved it from late 1862 and not late, mid-1861 
until the end of the war, it was in Richmond, Virginia. Just miles from Washington, D.C. So the Confederates moved their capital once. But this just kind of shows you the map of what kind of situation it looked like at that point. Yellow and orange are where sl you had slavery in the country. Green's where you did not have it. And then, of course, the orange actually denotes which states actually broke away and tried to form their own country as the Confederate states. And also here we have two, three other things, actually four. Here is the first national flag the Confederacy came up with. This was adopted, I mean, this is edited to look like it was between July and November of 1861 when there were 11 southern states that eventually came to secede. It was not the stars and it was not the uh, general, the General Lee flag as we commonly think of now when we think of Confederate flag. It was this. This was the very first Confederate flag or the stars and bars as it was called. It was that the flag that we commonly associate with the Confederacy was actually the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, which was the Army of Robert E. Lee. Now, the Confederacy did later incorporate Lee's battle flag into its two other national flags it had in the upper left quadrant, about where the blue, blue, where the blue background and the stars are on this one. But that was later on. The very first Confederate flag was the stars and bars, and they had this until about. I think about 1863. So basically halfway through the war, they had fought under this flag. Then you had your Confederate president, Jefferson Davis, who was a former senator from Mississippi. He was also former secretary of war under President Franklin Pierce. And he owned slaves. He was very staunch defender of Southern slavery institutions. And then, of course, we have our guy that said that slavery is a black man's natural place, which hate to tell this guy this, it's not. They're equal. African Americans and whites are equal in every sense of the word. Alexander Stevens of Georgia was the Confederate vice president. Then here, I don't want to show anything, uh, I got, don't want to show anything else really of uh, any inappropriate Confederate things, so I kind of just cut it off there. But here, there's something that is. Well, the, I mentioned we know well, no, the, we all know that the Confederacy tried to create its own nation. The Southern states tried to create a Southern nation, and they did so in every sense of the word. They adopted their own. Pre, they elected their own president and vice president. Their own Congress. They had their own constitution. Tried to establish their own court system. They had their own army. Oh my goodness, they had their own flag, they tried to come to terms on a national anthem, and they even went to the point to adopt a national currency. Yes, a national currency. And the unique thing that we must, we must mention about Confederate currency is really, they adopted paper currency. Now, you might say, well, why is that significant? We have paper currency now. Because until the Confederacy, it was nothing but coins. There was no paper currency. And what's significant is the United States at the point at that point did not have paper currency as of yet. It wasn't until the middle of the Civil War that the Union started issuing greenbacks or paper money to try to save metal and eventually just adopted that and kept it after the war had ended. And we still use paper money today and we still use coins today. But until that point, it was just coins, metal coins. Well, after... Well, the Confederates, they adopt paper money. What's significant is they're actually the first ones to use paper money. They used paper money before the United States did, about two years prior to the United States ever doing so. So I have some replicas here. These are not the real thing, but they're replicas of some actual replicas of certain of a couple of Confederate banknotes or money, Confederate money. Shows you what they had. And just to illustrate the fact that the Confederates tried to create their own nation, even down to the process of having their own currency. So right here we have a replica of the Confederate one dollar bill. This is that, if you need to look at that at all. Had a Southern senator on it. I forget what his name was. Hold on. Actually, I got a thing on here that tells us. 
This has a portrait on a dollar bill of Confederate Senator from Alabama, Clement C. Clay. Now, the funny thing is about this Confederate money was the factor that the Confederacy, it really lacked the metal to back up its currency. Because back then, and I think it even to a degree, even to a thing today, money is backed up by precious metals. Its value is backed up by the amount of precious metals that a country has in stock. Well, the Confederacy was very much not exactly the best on precious metal storage. They were kind of having to fight a war, so they needed that metal. And they also did a major mistake is they printed too much money. They printed more money than they needed, really. They printed way too much. And it came to the point the Confederacy suffered from massive inflation during its tenure as a supposed nation to the point that just one Confederate dollar bill, that Confederate dollar bill, by the end of the war, this thing was only worth two cents. Yeah. Two cents. Two cents, people. Two cents. You can tell the Confederate economy was basically, it was destroyed. Now, also of unique is the fact that the Confederacy, today we think of a dollar bill. Well, we put, there's like, as you know, it's printed on both sides. Well, the Confederates, in an effort to save time and money in the printing process, they only printed on one side of the dollar bills usually. The other sides were typically blank. So this is a Confederate $1 bill. Remember, this was worth two cents. We're going to use this as a standard to calculate some of these bills. Now, I can't remember all of them outright, so we will go with what I remember. I calculated them earlier, but this is two cents. So this is a standard. This is a one. This is worth two cents by the end of the war. Next one we have here is we have a $5 bill replica showing the... Me, I got to look who's on the bill. The Confederate, I must give the Confederates credit, though. They had some intricate designs on bills. That's some intricate designs. This one has the state capitol at Richmond, Virginia, pictured and a portrait of Christopher G. Memminger, who was the Confederate Secretary of the Treasury. So this is the Confederate Secretary of the Treasury, Christopher Menning, Menning, Memminger. And then over here, you have a picture of the state capitol in Richmond. So this is a $5 bill. Replica, of course. These are all replicas. If this was a real thing, I wouldn't probably be showing it because it would probably be hard to see anything. They're ragged, they're jagged, torn, got holes in them, very faded. This is the five. We have, and if this was worth two cents, this thing would have been, this thing right here, this, I think it would have been worth a dime. This is worth a dime by the end of the war. Five dollars is worth a dime. Imagine how you're going to even buy bread. We have a Confederate ten dollar bill who has the portrait of Robert Hunter, who was the Confederate Secretary of State. So this would have been worth about, I think, 20 cents. By the end of the war, 20 cents. And a fun thing to note on these Confederate bills that I've noticed is that up, if you ever look, you'll see up here, I don't think you can really read it, but I can read it here and I'll try to show it after I read it, is in the very top, there's always this little thing that's, it, it, it changes the time frame, like two months, like two months, six months, two years, but it will say, in this one's case, it says six months after the ratification of a treaty of peace between the Confederate States and the United States. May I keep you in mind that I don't know why it would actually say this, because there was never a treaty between the Confederate States and the United States. It was never a peace treaty, but mostly because the United States never actually recognized the Confederacy as an independent nation. So, yeah, I don't know why they actually say that, but they do. <laughs> now, let me see if I can get a date on These things have dates. This... I can't quite tell. I just I can see it says 1861, but here, in case you want to try to read it, trying to read the small print. It says fundable and eight percent stock on bonds of the Confederate States of America. It's it'd be right here. I don't know if you can really make it out, but I'll put it real close. Alright. So this was worth Two cents. Well, not two cents, but uh, two dimes. 
20 cents at the end of the war. Worthless money. Then we have a $20 bill, which of the designs of the money, I actually like the $20 bill's design. I think it's actually kind of neat. Regardless of what the Confederacy stood for, but I'm saying just the I'm saying the designs of the money is neat. I'm not saying the Confederacy was good. I'm saying I just like the money designs. Just like I like money designs today, I like how they look. But this is actually a tw Confederate twenty twenty dollar bill. Here you have the portrait of Confederate President Vice President uh, Alexander Stevens, who these two are the same guy. The 20, and then in the center, you have a illustration of the goddess Cupid for some reason. Well, let me think. Hmm? Well, you have Cupid over here, and then you have the goddess of industry, actually, is what it is. I'm reading off the package these things came in. I bought these down in, like, Charleston, South Carolina, like two years ago, and I went down there. This is a $20 bill, so by the end of the war, I actually calculated this one. This one would have been worth... This $20 bill was equal to a dollar by the end of the war. This would have been worth a dollar. So one of these, if you trade this in at 1864, 1865, and according to this one, it was printed in September of 1861, but if you had had one of these at the end of the Civil War in 1865, and you wanted to trade it in, the most they would have given you is this, because this is what this is now equal to. Actually, they wouldn't have given you this, because this was only worth two cents. They had nothing they could really give it, give to you to really equal it. But this would have been worth a dollar by the end of the war. You had to have a 20 just to have a dollar in buying power. Then finally... Oh, wait, no, not finally. We have a $50 Confederate bill. This one has a portrait of Jefferson Davis on it. Dude, Confederate president. Remember, the only reason I'm showing this is because, A, I like the designs, and I think it's kind of cool that these are replicas. They, they're kind of cool in my mind. And anyway, also the fact, just to illustrate just how far the South went trying to create its own nation in defense of slavery. They went to the point that they created their own government, their own everything, down, right down to the currency. They took time to do that. So this is the 50. I don't remember how much this would have been worth. I think it probably would have been worth maybe five bucks. I am not exactly certain. It probably, probably right on there. I'm not entirely certain. I can't remember what the calculation was for this one, but you can do it on your own. Take two cents and times it by 50. What do you get? But this was the $50 bill. Then here, now this is a rare one. This one you probably would not have seen very much. It was only, according to this, this is a Confederate $1,000 uh, money. In this one, you have a portrait of John C. Calhoun, that senator we talked about, who had already died around 1850, but that he was a Southern icon, so they put him on here. And then it's President Andrew Jackson from earlier on. Now, very few Confederate $1,000 bills were printed out, and that, I get that from the envelope, which says on this thing, where was it? It says that the only $1,000 dollar confederate note and the highest denomination only 607 were issued from the first capital in montgomery alabama pictured on the left is john c calhoun firebrand secessionist of south carolina on the right is president andrew jackson so there were only 607 these 607 of these ever actually issued by the confederate government and they were only issued from the capital at montgomery there were never really any others issued at any other point during its tenure as the supposed nation and I did do the calculation on this, and this one's going to kill you. At the end of the war, if you have to be a, one of those lucky individuals that had one of the, the only 607 copies of a $1,000 Confederate banknote, this $1,000 note is only worth 20 bucks. 
that shows you how inflated the economy had become. You had to have a $1,000 note to have the buying power of $20 outright without maybe obtaining. Remember, it would take, you would have to buy 20 of these to even get 20 bucks. This, you just need one. So anyway, I think that's going to go ahead and end our video today. I just want to show that stuff to kind of, the money especially, just to kind of illustrate just how far the South went. Our next video will be on the Lost Cause narrative. Oh, what, how exactly that came about and what exactly how it's actually wrong. So we're going to do that either at the end of this week or next week. Or next week, we'll see how it goes. So if any questions arise, go ahead, feel free to put them in the video at the comment section below. I understand that this was a little bit confusing given the factor that I kind of had to split the video due to a uh, malfunction. But given the fact that we went almost 30 minutes here, I'm not going to say it wasn't a bad idea to split it. So, <laughs> so if you have any questions, um, post those in the comment section below. Uh, do be certain to watch the first part of this kind of duology video if you did not watch the first part because this kind of got messed up due to a small mishap of a pet. <laughs> so um, be sure to watch that if you didn't to fully understand what we're talking about here. And as always, like, subscribe, leave comments, leave suggestions, any of that stuff as usual. So... I think that concludes it for tonight, so we'll go ahead and sign off here, so hopefully everyone stays safe through the giant snowstorm that's moving through the Midwest right now, and may everyone have a wonderful rest of their week, and may God bless you all.